I'm okay. Thank you so much for agreeing to participate in this important video series. Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week was created to get college students educated and about homelessness and involved in their communities to help the homeless. So this video series will consist of a wrap-up video and six videos with the National Coalition for the Homeless Faces of Homelessness Speakers Bureau. So today we'll be discussing healthcare, but first, tell me more about your story, your lived experience. Well, um, my story started uh, when I was very young. Um, I was homeless, even as a juvenile because um, I was abused and had very traumatic childhood. So I was always running away from home. So I was homeless in the streets as a child. So when I finally got emancipated at 15 years of age and went to live into independent living in another state in Maryland, what happened was I ended up not knowing how to take care of myself, not knowing how to take care of my children early on. I became... Um, pretty promiscuous, I would say. And I started having kids 15, 16, 19, and 23. By the time I was 23, I had five children. And um, I didn't know how to survive. I didn't know how to live. I didn't know how to survive my emotions. And the only thing I knew how to do was to use to not feel what I was feeling from the early childhood unaddressed trauma, traumas and experiences and pain that I had been through in my early childhood trauma. And my children kind of paid for the price for that because I didn't know how to be a mommy. So as my children suffered and I went through living out my trauma for stages, um, I met, met, met men who, because I was abused as a child, I thought some men didn't abuse me, they didn't love me. So that was my domestic violence. And that added more trauma to my life. And finally, at some point, I began abusing major drugs, which I started previous in cocaine in the early 80s. Um, the crack epidemic had not hit. And when the crack epidemic hit, I lost my children. I lost my home. I lost everything. Um, and then one of my children died while in the foster care system. He was nine years of age. Very child. At that point, I don't think I even wanted to be alone for the rest of my children at that time because I, the pain was unbearable. My undiagnosed traumas and mental health disorders, along with my substance abuse use, just led me straight into the streets because I didn't see any hope. I didn't think that there was any, any life for me. And I was envisioned myself just dying. I was already dead inside at some point. So I thought I was just going to die in the streets. So I just went to the streets where I felt like that was just going to be my end. And what actually ended up happening is I spent 17 years on the streets of the nation's capital because my husband, who I did marry, was from Washington, D.C., and he was a drug dealer. And he brought me here. And as soon as we got here, he ended up going to prison for four to 12 years. And mother's children had gotten all put up for adoption uh, because they were in foster care for so long through my addiction. But we had one child together, and um, his family raised her. And I was in the streets of the nation's capital for 17 years, and I was occurring more and more traumas and more and more mental illnesses because of my self-esteem being low and promiscuous in the streets and committing crimes and going in and out to jail, prison systems. And I just believed that that was just it for me. And I was going to these soup kitchens and using some of the resources little bit by little bit in the street because I was being taught in the street by a group of people that were also homeless that surrounded me because they seen I was a female out there alone. So you kind of gain this family unit in the homeless community and they were teaching me survival skills. So for those 17 years, the people that taught me the survival skills kind of became my family and they were taking me to these churches and these different organizations to get clothing, uh, to, know, to be able to know where to take a shower. And the directors and the assistant directors were always saying there's just something different about you. And I shrugged it off because the streets were my home. And I now have somewhere where I felt, felt like I fit in with this homeless family. I felt a belonging to this homeless family. And we had loyalty among ourselves. We went to sleep with nothing and shared everything we had, even though we had nothing. We always woke up and we were, I realized we were some of the most resourceful people and some of the most educated people, and some of the most creative people in the world. So I had a glimmer of hope, 
even though I was resigned to dying in the street. And I didn't realize it then, but in retrospect now, that's what helped me hold on in my faith in God. I was raised it, I, I was raised to believe in God early on in my childhood, even though through all the traumas that I endured. So little bit by little bit, I felt at the end of the road, all the domestic violence that goes on and the, the rape, I was raped in the streets. I, my jaw was broke because when I got drunk, I had a mouth on me, you know, and it didn't matter who you were. I became very violent myself. Um, not only did I use drugs, I practiced sell drugs, but it doesn't work real well when you're a user. So at that point, I just, 17 years just kind of went so quickly, all the seasons, and I wasn't a person to go into shelters. So I slept, literally slept on the park benches in the concrete. And I kind of was a chameleon. I think they had different communities of the homeless. You had Fairness uh, Square, Franklin Park, Fortune Hill, Fish and Cape, Pennsylvania, 12th and then. And I just fit in anywhere I went so I can maneuver when I got tired of one setting maneuver to another. And at the end of it all, um, Pathways to Housing Homeless Outreach, it's a nonprofit uh, collaborative. It's not a CSA. But um, they actually could try to give me housing in 2006, and I would accept their outreach services. But at that point, I had a family in the street, and I couldn't see myself leaving my family in the street. And that's where my mind frame was and my spirit was, I can't leave these people behind. Because they're the only family I've ever known that I felt like weren't going to abuse me or abuse me. You know, they always had my back. And that's where my spirit was at that time. And in 2009, um, they finally didn't take no for an answer. And the outreach team came out and told me to pack my stuff. I wasn't coming back. And they took me to a mental health crisis house called Pressing Plates. And I stayed there, I think, for nine days. And I didn't believe them. After 17 years on the street, you don't think there's any hope for you. And they took me to look at two apartments. And I picked one. And within nine days, I was in my own very first apartment after all those years on the street. And it was amazing having my own key to my apartment. It was amazing feeling. And I was so grateful. And I asked them, why me? Why me? Out of all these people you got to pick from, why me? And they said, we've seen the potential in you. And I didn't even realize that the potential they seen wasn't even a little bit of potential. You know, it was just like a tiny bit of potential they'd seen and they ran with it. And in 2009, I still was in that I can't leave my friends in the street type of mentality. So I brought all my friends into my first apartment. I had a two bedroom apartment and I had cots set up in my living room. So everybody that I wanted to come in from the street could come in from the street. And through that year of that lease, I quickly learned that that doesn't work. Well, for your spirit, for your growth, um, it, it was really chaotic. Um, it was really just like I come home. If I go somewhere and come home, the police would be in my house and they had nothing to do with me. They were there fighting. They're, you know, they're in my apartment. So I was like, okay, this doesn't work. So the next time I moved, I cut back on allowing the friends to come over. I would still let people come over, take a shower and eat. And gradually as you grow through that, because you know, it's housing first. You don't have to address your mental health issues or your substance abuse issues. So I'm still feeling homeless men mentally. I might be housed, but homeless, but I'm still homeless mentally, and I'm still in the street with, in my mind. So I was out the side every day, even though I had my own keys, and I would only go home at night because that's what I knew. That's how I knew how to live. And finally, in 2014, I was in so many domestic violent relationships, and the substance abuse was getting old, and I was kind of at the end of the road. And May the 6th of 2014, my spirit was just broken. And the only way that I could help my friends out there was to work on me and become a better version of me and to elevate as high as I can. Um, and my people think I do this for selfish reasons and I don't. I'm not getting as many certifications as I am and getting all the associates and bachelor's degrees as I can for selfish reasons. I'm doing it to help as many people. as Because my process and my purpose and my passion is homelessness. My purpose and passion is to help those with mental health disorders except the fact that they have a mental health disorder and it's okay. We need to break the stigma around homelessness, having a mental health disorder, um, around substance abuse issues that we we can and we do recover that from the mental health issues. Because if, you are, if you're willing to be diagnosed and take your medication and see a psychiatrist and accept the fact that you can get baseline 
through that direction, then we can work on the substance abuse disorders and we can be, we can get clean, we can get sober. There's many different ways to recover and I'm open to that. I'm a recovery coach. Now I'm in a 12 step program and I do this one day at a time with a sponsor, with a network, with a fellowship. And um, I'm open to suggestions. I'm willing, I remain teachable. I try to remain as humble as possible. Well, I'm a go-getter, I'm a goal setter I achieve things. And today, I never achieved anything in my life. And when I walked across that first stage in 2016, I walked across three stages. I just seen the vision in my head, those caps and gowns. And I got diagnosed with lupus in 2015, the first year, my first year of being clean. And I remember thinking to myself, this is not going to stop me. This is not, I'm not going to let this identify, this is not going to be my identity. This is not going to be to me from achieving any of my goals. When the doctor told me, I said, how do we treat it? He said, there's no cure. I said, but you can treat my symptoms, right? He said, yeah. So, okay, well, let's do this because I got, I got life to get. I got things to do. I got goals to achieve. And what you is know, lupus? Got, excuse me? I said, what is lupus? Lupus, I have an autoimmune disease and my immune system attacks my organs because mm-hmm. it thinks it's foreign bodies. And if I get too stressed out, um, that's when it starts attacking. I'll go into fatigue. I'll go into pain. It happens while I'm driving. It can happen in any given situation. So it's up to me not to let people into my space to upset me or give people that much power. And that's why I'm so grateful that I have the tools that I have to know when to turn away, to walk away, or to shut people out, or to push people to a different level in my life or a different role in my life where they may be gone. Because my peace has to remain intact at all times. No matter what it takes, it could be family members, it could be anybody, it could be people that I love dearly. I just have to love you from over there. Right, right. And when we're talking about um, addiction services, um, how does it serve the needs of people who are homeless? Does it serve them or does it not serve them? It does serve them. Um, I'm happy to ask that question. I was homeless when I went in to PIW numerous times. Um, one way that I was, like when I needed like an oil change, as they call it, I needed a break from getting high. I would go into the hospitals and say I felt suicidal. They cannot, re- they cannot refuse to give you a bed and meals, and they cannot refuse to take mm-hmm. you in. And it wasn't that I felt suicidal. It's that I knew that was my quickest way of getting to the unit, even though I was going to be locked in. But I knew I was going to get that seven-day break. And that's not, I don't suggest that people do that. I just, you know, know that that's one of the ways that the homeless survive hmm. on the street when they need that break. That's one and of the things. That's one of the things you touched on. It's what I call um, the homeless mindset. Like you said, mm-hmm. you're still in the mentality of being homeless. I, I use that phrase to describe any length of time one experiences home or the PTSD arising from any length of time one experiences homelessness. Because it doesn't matter if it's just a month, if it's 17 years. As you were, the the longer it is, the more deep seated those issues are going to be. You're going to be wanting to help all your friends that you really had in the community out there. And you're going to maybe keep your stuff in bags and not even know why. And it's going to take years of being removed from homelessness. And all of a sudden, all of these other issues start cropping up. You're like, wow, why am I feeling this way? Why everything's going the best that it has ever gone? Why do I feel this way? And suddenly you have to repair, you know, relationships you may want to keep and sever those that you don't. Like, wait a minute, you weren't there for me when I needed you, but now you're here for me when I'm doing well. And there's just a whole lot of things that come. And as you said, we're housing first, we're real shelter focus, put a roof over somebody's head and all of their problems are solved. But that's not the case, is it? No, it's actually not the case. But I am a big fan of housing first. It, it does it, help. It does help. It gives you the, it gives you the foundation yes. to make the decision. Well, it gives you the, the choice to get clean, to get baseline. And I didn't. It took me from 2009 until 2014 to make that decision. But I had those keys and I had that roof and I was no longer getting, no longer having violent men coming up and to whip me for no reason because they were high. I was no longer getting gang raped or being pulled off a bench by strange men. I was no longer getting pushed into cars by strange men and being raped over and over repeatedly. And those things were, you know, those things were really happening to me on the street. So because I was vented off by myself. Oh, so, 
I was one of those people that was real curious and vision off in the different neighborhoods. So those things were actually happening. And it happened with people that was in my was in my family crew. Um, I was a person that always had money and always had drugs. So of course people wanted to be around me all the time. And if I cut someone off, then of course they were mad and I had one of them pay somebody to break my jaw. And my mouth got wired shut. And he had to be my boyfriend at the time. You know, um, today we're both in recovery. But, you know, like things like that do happen. It is violent out there. And today more so than when I was out there. Yes. So, and, and as you said, housing first is super important because it doesn't discriminate. It says no matter where you are at, we're going to meet you and give you a roof over your head. Because without a roof over your head, you can't even really begin to deal with any of your mental health issues or any of your physical health issues as well. So it is very important. But as you said, it's often just housing first. And then there you go. Yeah. And some people don't use it as a foundation. Mm-hmm. I myself, like I want to touch on uh, something you said about baggage. I have been fortunate enough and thank God that I'm so grateful that I've been able to unpack all of those bags. And I, but I've only done that through step work and sponsorship and being in a 12 step program mm-hmm. and having the courage to face my demons and having the courage to say, okay, I forgive you for the incest. I forgive you for abusing me as a child. And then him never, him taking it to the grave and being an okay with an apology. I'm never going to get that's molded me in, into character. It's built me a, it's molded my character and my integrity and my perseverance and my strength and my courage. It's made me the woman I am today. I've forgiven myself for my son dying of foster care. You know, the, the more authentic I get with my truth and the more truth I speak about myself, when you put it in the air, it doesn't fester inside of me. It has no more power. And then I become the woman that I should have been all along. There's no more secrets. I don't have secrets. I don't keep secrets. So I've been able to unpack those eggs from that trauma and I have the courage to share it so that I can hope to help, hopefully help someone that may be going through that at the age I was or that's going through it at, as an adult that can come to me and say, hey, what resources did you get used to get through this? How did you get over and jump over this hurdle? How did you get through this? How did you get through that? And I can take your hand and guide them to get what they need. And when we talk about healthcare, you know, you pointed out a very important thing, not only the violence, but also especially for women, sexual assault and rape that occurs while on the streets. And oftentimes you won't go to the police because, I mean, even if you go to the police once, you quickly find out that the way they view you when you're homeless, you don't get the same help. They're like, oh yeah, you're a young woman. You should get the same help, but they don't because they're like, how did you even get in this situation? And they don't understand. They don't. And then they're, they've said things to me such as, um, are you sure you, he, you didn't get in the car with him and he just didn't want to pay you your money? Are you sure it wasn't a trick? Or, you know, things like that. Um, you know, and they've waved me off plenty of times. So they don't take you serious when you're homeless. And when you're homeless, you just want to be noticed. And you know, after being out there for so many years, I knew, I knew who I was on the inside, but I just really felt like that was hopeless because I didn't even think nobody, any, anybody really knew my name in society. So you feel invisible and people walk by you look just look disgust on their face because I didn't look like I look today. And, you know, people don't even believe when I show them the picture of me then and me now. And it's just I felt like I was being I was being stereotyped, just like everyone else stereotypes a homeless individual. But if they only knew the person inside in the back story, then they might have thought twice. So I'm so grateful to be part of the Speakers Bureau who's able to share that, yes, that was me then and this is me now. And this is the person I was then, too. I was just in so much pain. That's the drug abuse and the mental health disorders covered up who I truly was. And one thing people don't realize about drug use is that, as you said, you're using it to numb the pain. A lot of things that homeless people do is just to survive, just to get to the next day. And that's what they need to be able to get to the next day, because at some point you'll reach a point where it's just like, oh, everyone's you're basically like a second class citizen all of a sudden. No, you see the worst of humanity, people just walking by you every single day and not really caring about you and, you know, doing the opposite of, you know, before by neutral they're they can even be really, really mean to you just by the face, just by the cause that you don't have a place to go. Not only that, one thing also 
I'm not sure if you experienced this in your time, but just being able to use the bathroom as like a woman, as like a human being is you have to go in and ask somebody. You might have to purchase a candy bar. You might have to walk 10 blocks to find the one spot that will let you use the bathroom. And that affects your healthcare too. You're not able to clean up. You're not able to do what you need to do. One thing that I really find during this pandemic is um, everybody suddenly closing off their bathrooms more, even though we're facing an eviction crisis. And even though the homelessness population is growing, how is it going to help people in a pandemic? You say you're dirty, you can't get a job, but we're also not going to let you clean up in our bathrooms. Right. Like I've actually had people tell me I couldn't use the restroom because my shirt was actually filthy dirty. I have to buy something. No, they know I don't have the money to buy at that point in the time because I just woke up. Of course, I can give money later on that day, but I have to use the restroom right now. So I have literally peed on myself at points because I didn't have anywhere to go and I couldn't hold it any longer. I have literally pulled my pants down outside out of frustration in public and just peed. <laughs> you know, that's what that was the, that was the mental um, instability that I had and the frustration I had at people just start, just looking at me a certain way, you know, and um, I've even defecated outside because there are people wouldn't let me use the restroom. You know, so it was like, I knew it, I knew in my mind it was wrong, but at that point in present time, I was mentally unstable and I was like, okay, look, if you won't let me use the restroom, I got to go now, I can't hold it, it is what it is. And you know? how hard was it for you to find addiction treatment? Addiction treatment was always available. And um, back in those days, it was the resources were readily available. When I got clean, they're not as readily available. Like I today can place people in detox and rehab. I'm a mental health certified peer and I'm a recovery coach in the DC area. So I can put people in detox individuals when they're ready. And I ask people all the time, do you want to go in detox? Do you want to go in rehab? I can say to you. But um, a lot of people just aren't ready yet that I deal with. But it's not as readily available as it was. Because at one point, you could just say, hey, I'm ready. And you would be in the chip that day. And, um, there's people now you have to be certified. You have to be credentialed to be able to place people when you talk to me. Before, anybody could just call over and just you know, Now, sometimes you have to have the right insurance. They want to know exactly what your insurance is. They, you know, they want to know um, how many times have you been here? Uh, what drug of choice are you? Is it before it was just like you could walk to the door and just get a bed? Now there's a lot more, um, they have a lot more uh, qualifications that must be met in order to get a bed. Mm. And some of the treatment programs, like you said, it's so important to also have that place to go because some of the treatment programs might just discharge you back to the streets. Exactly. Right now, they're, you know, honest, today they're focusing more on opioids than anything else. They, they will put you in detox for alcohol because alcohol, you can go into DTs. But when you tell them that you did crack, they might put you in there for three days and they're going to send you back to the street. Because to them, crack, but what they sort of realize is they're putting fentanyl on crack too these days. Um, I just had a friend in the streets that hit crack and died. As um, soon as he hit the crack, because they're putting fentanyl on crack. And he was one of the people that was in my home last mm -hmm. week. He just, he just passed away um, from fentanyl being on the crack cocaine. But um, they're really focused on opioid because that's where the federal government is sending all the money to the opioid. And they want to they know everything about opioids. They're and that's another thing that homeless people face. Like you said, it's a real community. There's, there's, you have a regular, regular society. And then underneath you have a society of homeless people. Uh -huh. pretty much, that function as their own in their own silos and teach each other. And there's, you know, it's it's a whole different atmosphere as well. But like you said, oftentimes you do form these little families. But if you don't see them for a while, you can catch up with someone and be like, oh, did you hear so-and-so died? And how does that affect one mental health? It, it affects me, but um, I know death is a part of life now. I've grown into that process. In the beginning, it was really, really painful for me. And I was having memorials. I'm the type that will put my own money, use my own money and go get sandwiches and balloons and cookies. And then I had to give the family that I formed in the street to give us time to heal so that they can say their goodbyes. You know, and then I would invite everyone from the homeless family. But now majority of the homeless family is gone mm. that I had that I had in the street for all those 17 years. They're either gone or in jail or dead. 
you know, so they're, they're either in recovery dead or in jail. A majority of them have passed away. Mm. And it's, it's really sad. The majority of them passed away and we didn't get to say goodbye. So I do memorials every year and just put everybody's name on a cake now because I can't do it individually because so many have passed on. Mm. And you talked about people that right now there's a problem with insurance. Oh, what kind of insurance do you have? Where's your insurance card? I know when I was homeless, I was lucky because Obama had just passed his um, health care act. And therefore in the homeless centers, they were like, here, let us sign you up for health care. I'm like, why do I need this? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Sign up for health care. And uh, it's, it's very interesting because you don't realize how much you need health care until you're in a more privileged position. And then but today I have a mayor health, but this is the thing. I am ready to graduate from my um, collaborative pathways to housing. I'm a double major at Stern University getting my psychology degree and my criminal justice degree. And I have all kinds of certifications and I can work in DC government. I just came from working in the Department of Behavioral Health and, I'm, and I still have connections there so I can still do DC government work even though I know I'm not currently working there. Um, however, Pathways doesn't want to let me go and I have to turn down a lot of positions that I'm offered like for DC and all these different DC government agencies because they pay 45 and 50 and $60,000 a year because it would terminate my insurance, which then I have an in-house voucher now, in HUD, it's in policy that I get a moving on voucher and graduate from my collaborative because I receive no services from them. The only thing they do is have some man house voucher. Well, HUD says it's in policy, but housing authorities are refusing to follow HUD's policy mm. and give me the moving on voucher. So it's like it's a catch-22. It's systematic racism where I'm they're not willing to follow HUD's policy to give me the moving on voucher and my insurance ties me to this collaborative where I can't make too much money or I'll lose my in-house voucher. So right. it's like, I'm at that point where I'm ready to fly and I have the courage to fly and just jump off and let go of the SSI, let go of the Medicaid and just be a productive member of society and they don't want to let me go. Mm. And how... How did it feel when you first started getting treatment for your addiction? Um, I was scared. I was really scared my first year because I thought to myself, can I do this? Because the first year is the hardest year. The first year is the year you're really looking at yourself and you're really going to self-inventory and you're not using one day at a time. And using, running from my pain and using was the only thing I knew how to do. And now I have to survive my emotions. Now I have to live, feel everything happening to me in everyday life. Surviving your emotions is the hard part and not running to go get high or drink every time you feel something. You have to learn how to do that day by day by day by day by day. So the first 90 days was really hard. But after I hit that 90 day mark, I had a whole lot of women and a whole lot of people uplifting me and supporting me and saying, well, you got this. You can call us. You can call us. You can call us. And I tested them. I called them three and four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, I want to know you really there. Right. You know, and, and then when you get to your fourth step, there's a fourth step. Um, it's taking your searching and feeling more inventory. And then you have to literally face your demons. And you got to literally see if you can face your demons and not use. And when I got past the fourth step, I knew I was going to be okay. And I literally. You talked about getting your jaw wired shut. Now, how is... How was that experience? Because obviously you would have to go to the hospital to do so. Yeah, um, I didn't even get it done. Um, the night I got my jaw broke, I still stayed in the street getting high and went to the hospital the next day. and got my mouth wired shut. And then I literally was still outside getting high with my mouth wired shut. Like mm -hmm. That's how vicious. And um, the, the disease is cunning and baffling. It, it just, it don't work. Through. Even now I'm in recovery. It comes to me all the time. But see, now that I'm on a spiritual journey, I can see it. I know it's working for people. I know it's working through situations. I know it's working through different scenarios. So I can see it and say, not today. <laughs> you how, know, but how long did it take you to heal? Because you're at a place now, and I know this, because um, I've seen you speak, and we went out to dinner, and I've met you, and I've talked to you, and I'm just so impressed with how I, I don't want to use the term how healed you are, but like how 
confident you are, how just you're so in love with yourself. You know who you are. You're, you know, you've, you've accepted, you've forgiven, you've moved on. You're able to, you know, you're, you're like on a level that most people will never even reach. So, but how long did that process take? It's an ongoing, maybe you can explain better what I'm trying okay. to refer to. It's an ongoing process. It, 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 it's, it's a lot of work. Like I, I stomped in here. I cried. You know, I threw temper tantrums. You know, you had a, there was a lot of tears shed. Trust me. You know, the hardest part of this process was forgiving myself. Mm. Forgiving myself, reliving my son dying and being buried. Forgiving my father for molesting me, forgiving my mother for abusing me because it was vicious, you know, telling me she, she hated me. She wished I was never born. She should have aborted me. I was ugly. I'd never be nothing. I'd never be nobody. When that's bit, when it's drilled into your head as five and a seven year old child, you know, and you can remember those things. That is like so, so traumatic. And then to be able to see yourself turn and build your, be able to be built and molded in someone who is a loving, caring, productive member of society who gives back in major ways and touches other people's lives and just lives your life to inspire and to give hope to other people, then, you know, it's like, it's an amazing feeling and it inspires my, I inspire me and other people inspire me. And I watch other people who, who have grown more than I have. And uh, it just keeps me going every day to look around my apartment. I don't have everything best of everything. And I'm living on $744 a month. And I, I remain grateful. My gratitude level is so great that the gratitude I feel to God for just allowing me to wake up every day and to look around and see that I, not do I just have some clothes. I have brand new clothes in my closet. I haven't even worn. I have a refrigerator filled with food. I have TVs that I can just flip channels. I can lay in my bed. I have a shower. I jump out to my and jump in any time. And you have to remember for 17 consecutive years here and 10 years in Maryland, I was homeless sleeping on park benches and concrete. So I came, I literally rose from the dirt. So like that gratitude level I feel and then working on me just one beam at a time, one trauma at a time. It was, it was a lot of work, but I'm really, really in a place of peace. We're learning to put people in the proper perspectives. And when you feel negative vibes or negative energy, whoa, backing up, it, that's hard because you really love those people and you want those people in your life. But they're not meant to be there. And learning to leave a door shut when it's meant to be shut because of God can put more people there that are meant to be there to help you to the next level of elevation. That's a process all by itself too. But acceptance learning that I have to accept situations as they come and as they occur and stand back and get out my own way. That's how the confidence comes in because I watch my life prosper before me. I watch me make major decisions before me that I would never make before. I watch my attitude and my behavior change. And I say things that I might not be thinking, but the way they come out is very professional, very loving, very caring, even though the straight me might be in my head, not what comes out of my mouth. And one thing that somebody said to me, my boyfriend's mother actually said it to me, and it really struck me was, and this is the first time I even heard this term, self-care. It's often a buzzword now, but she said, there is a difference between selfishness and self-care. And you kind of had to experience that because, you know, you'll let people stay in a space where you're staying, like your apartment. And then, like you said, the cops will be there, they'll fight or they're, they're not doing what they should be doing. So they won't help clean you or clean you. They won't help clean up and they won't help, you know, like do any laundry and things like that. So you come home and you expect to just be able to chill as you get more used to this new environment. But instead, it's just more of the same. And taking that time to really self-care, how important is that? That is so important because I can't help anybody if I'm running on an empty cup. So now, the last two apartments I've lived in, nobody's allowed in my home. Nobody can cross my threshold unless it's somebody professional or someone that I felt their spirit out in the street. And then I might say, do you want to come over for dinner? And trust me, if I do that, I've totally felt their spirit out. I don't have company. 
because this is my peace. This is my sanctuary. And I've learned to protect my spirit because I've done that. I've ran on an empty cup and poured from an empty cup for so long. And what happens is I end up feeling it. The lupus kicks in and I go down and I get put in the hospital. And I learned, okay, what happens to me mentally and um, psychologically affects me physically. So I've had to learn through lessons because everything's a lesson or a blessing. And I've learned the hard way sometimes because I'm already hated at times that the ter- things I have to do different. Because if you keep making the same choice, you're going to keep getting the same result. So I've made some different choices. And what would you like people to do when they see somebody that's on the street, when they see somebody that's homeless? What would actually help people? What would actually help is if you don't know what to do, smile, speak. You know, and if you feel so inclined, you can sit down and say, hi, I'm Dave or I'm Lisa or what's your name? You know, and if they say something back, say, man, what's your story? Because we all have a backstory. You know, just make them feel human. Take away that dehumanizing feeling. And if you don't want to feel comfortable sitting down and doing that, you can pack an extra sandwich in your lunch and just say, I see you sitting here and I just thought I'd get, offer you a sandwich and a soda or a sandwich and a water. And if you don't feel comfortable with that, a gift card. You don't always have to give money because people aren't comfortable giving money because they think they're going to use with it. They can't use with a gift card, you know. And socks are always in high demand. If you want to pack a kit, you can pack toothbrush, toothpaste, sanitary napkins for the females because sanitary products are something that the females truly need out there that they don't get a lot of. Those sanitary napkins. I love doing outreach. Um, so when we take the stuff out to them. You know, and just know that that's somebody's mother, sister, daughter, father, brother, and son, and that we are human. And it just helps so much. It makes a person's day that's homeless when you just act like they're human and you can see them. Yes. And um, what what advice do you have for people? What would you like to see the healthcare system do? I would like to see everyone who's homeless have health care. I would like to see outreach teams going out there signing everyone who's homeless up for health care. I know that there may be people who think they don't need health care or they're mentally unstable. And I think there needs to be outreach teams that goes out there to all the homeless if you have to section them off and sign them up for health care. And those that think they don't need health care, maybe you need to take a little bit more time with them and bring them into an office and, you know, get them seen by a psychiatrist. I mean, everyone needs to take time, build rapport with these people because they're individuals who actually need our help. And one thing also that people don't understand when we talk about like numbing the pain with using it's there's a lot that goes into it when you're homeless. So maybe you'll see somebody doing something and you're, you're judging them. But at the same time, sometimes when you're with somebody and it may not be the best situation or you go into that car with somebody or you go to somebody's house. It's because I get a place to stay for the night. If I'm using drugs, I'm not hungry. I haven't eaten in three days, but when I'm using, I'm not hungry. I can stay up all night. So I don't have to worry about watching my back. There's a lot of considerations that go into using when you're homeless. There's a lot of considerations. There's days I've stayed up. There's times I stayed up for five days straight. You know, of course I was, hallucinating and all those things, but there's times that I stayed up five days straight because I was scared to go to sleep because I was around people I didn't know. So I just kept using and using and using and using. And at some point, you don't even get high anymore. You just stay awake. Right. You know, and, but at some point, that's how you feel safe. <laughs> like you just don't want to go to sleep. You want to be alert. And, you know, and of course, um, I was in an outdoor prison system because, of course, if you're I'm an outside person. So, of course, if you're an outside person, eventually the police are going to get to know you. The police are going to get to know your name and they're going to run up on you. So, of course, I've been in I have a BCDT and a Fed number. So I was a revolving door at BT jail and the feds. I was in Alderson, West Virginia and Danbury, Connecticut. And eventually they used to tell me, welcome back, welcome home. You know, mm-hmm. and the last time I was in the jail was in 2002. And today I go back into the jails and I facilitate recovery groups on the RSA units. And you think there needs to be a different response to people who are homeless than other than the police? Because when the police come out, they'll often harass or harass, harass somebody. But that person has no place to go. You can't just, I mean, they do, but just harassing somebody, somebody for having no place to go is inhumane. I believe that when the police go out, I believe every police station should have at least two, a mental health peer, a recovery coach, or someone who's trained in both, 
to go out on calls with them like that. Someone who can relate to the person that they're going out to because they aren't trained in mental health. They aren't trained in recovery services. And I believe that they need someone that can have a build a quick report really quickly with that person. So also, people don't understand when we say these things, it's also for the police's benefit. It's also for the cops' benefit because they have to already do so much. And instead, let's diversify a little bit. Let's have other people take on some other roles that they're more specialized in. And that will take pressure off the police from having to be called for every single situation that we don't need police for. And I believe it would stop a lot of the shootings. I believe it would stop a lot of the killings here. They need someone they can identify with at that point in present time. And right then, everybody's scared. The police, the person that's in front of the police, everybody's in fear because they don't have no mediator as a go-between to say, hey, calm down, cool down. I'm about to walk to you, okay? You know, like, and you need people with courage is willing to do that. And I want those people that would be really willing. Like, I've lived in Southeast on Q Street. I've lived in, Mar I've lived on, um, over there on Minnesota Avenue. I know what the things that are going on. And I so I know most of the people. But there's not, you know, they need peers and they need substance abuse counselors that are actually on call to go with them to these calls. And for some reason, they're not doing it. But I really think that it would be amazing if they had us there. And as you've worked in various parts throughout the recovery process, all the way from the government to, you know, peer review, what is your, how can people best advocate for better health care policies concerning homeless people? The best way to advocate is to advocate before DC Gim, so before the Health Care Finance Committee. Um, that's the best, that's the first way to advocate. Um, the next way to advocate is just to keep writing letters um, that's that's the second way you can advocate, or to just keep sharing your story. But my advocacy would be before DC Council, before the Healthcare Finance Committee, because if enough people get down it before the DC Healthcare Finance Committee, they're not going to have a choice but to do something about it. And why the health? Why the DC Healthcare Finance Committee? Because um, the last time, what did they do? Um, the DC Healthcare Finance Committee. The last time I had an amazing job, and I had to resign because of the uh, the the pay was too high and they canceled my insurance and my housing was in jeopardy. I put myself down to go immediately get down there um, before Mr. Gray. And I was supposed to be talking about pathways to housing, receiving all these millions of dollars, but I used that opportunity to let them know what was happening with me. And then threw it as an afterthought. Oh yeah, please help pathways get the money they need. But I immediately went down there advocated for myself and let them know, look, you want us, I stepped outside your, Building for 17 years. I just got this amazing job. I'm a DB certified peer. I'm a mental health specialist. You know, I'm going to school. I got this amazing job with United Planning Organization, a comprehensive treatment center at the Myth Clinic. I'm a resource case manager. And I just had to resign yesterday because I made too much money and they terminated my health care, which ties me to this collaborative, which has my housing. Like, this is systematic racism. What are you guys going to do? <laughs> Like you're, you're, you're taught, you have an ankle around, my, you have a rope around my ankle. Like, do you want us to rise and become productive citizens of society, or do you want us to remain stagnant and on DC government? You know, do you want, you want the government to keep taking care of us? Like, what do you want us to do? And, and that's one thing people don't realize, right? People on disability, if they make too much, they lose their disability. And I know um, one of my biological brothers is autistic. He was working with Walmart. Now he's now he's in a, assisted living and he's loving it and he's being taken care of. And that's for life. And he's content there. But before he was working with Walmart, but Walmart was bringing him back to have seizures and, you know, bringing him back to every time he went to work at Walmart, he would be having seizures. And then he, he said, no, I can't just quit because they have my health insurance because I only get health insurance through my job and they're paying for my school. So if I leave my job, I actually lose everything. And that's one of the problems with, you know, oh, yeah, just get a job and they'll provide you health care. That is awesome that they provide health insurance. But there's also a problem with that. Exactly. So you have to advocate for yourself. And if you don't want to advocate for yourself, then get with an advocate and go in there and advocate for you. you know? And I'm definitely one of those people that tries to advocate for everybody. <laughs> and how can people get in contact with you? If, if they know somebody that does need help, how can they get in contact with your work? 
Well, you can contact me. I'm a speaker and advocate for the National Coalition for the Homeless. My name is Rochelle Ellison, or you can reach me at RochelleEllison74 at gmail.com. Um, you can email me there. Okay. And how did you get involved with the National Coalition for the Homeless Speakers Bureau? Well, uh, I was um, speaking. I actually did live television for Department of Behavior Health, sharing my opioid part of my story. Um, I was sharing for Department of Behavior Health. I was sharing my story and Steve had called me and said, I see you sharing your story for everybody else. Why don't you come and speak for the National College of Home? Mm. So I've been there ever since. Awesome. And do you have any <laughs> final words for everybody? I just want everyone to know that the homeless that you see all over the United States are not homeless because we choose to be homeless. We're homeless because we have pain somewhere Devastation somewhere, lost our job, natural disaster occurred. Trust and believe there's a reason behind the homeless population's existence. And we just ask that you have some compassion, some empathy, and find out what you can do to help and please not judge. And we need to break the stigma around homelessness. And I hope my story helped to inspire someone. Today, I'm, I'm doing amazing, as you can see. And I know that there's other people who would show you the same thing if you just give them the opportunity. See what you can do to help. Lend a hand, lend a smile. And know that that's somebody's mother, sister, brother, father, and son. Do you have any thoughts on the current pandemic and concerning homeless people? And I absolutely and, do. <laughs> for instance, also, oh what God. do you think would, what do you think would be going on right now if you were homeless right now, especially with lupus? Well, as Washington, D.C. did, I don't know if other places did. They took all the homeless off the street, placed them in hotels. They're giving them housing vouchers. They're moving them into housing as quickly as they can. And I would hope that all the other states are following suit as the District of Columbia is doing, trying to make sure that they have housing, make sure they have the proper PPE, make sure they're getting tested if they don't have the COVID vaccine, educate them on the COVID vaccine so that they're not scared to get the vaccine and doing everything possible to keep them as safe, as safe as they can. And I know you said you also have thoughts on the pandemic. <laughs> yes. I believe that um, this pandemic is not, the media is not covering the pandemic the way that they should be covering the pandemic. And in the beginning, they made it uh, bad, and they're not covering the real numbers of the people who are affected with, with the um What's the name of the Delta variant? With the Delta and variant. The, the Delta variant and the actual number of people that are getting breakthrough cases. Because I had the Johnson & Johnson, and I was just told that it was seven months ago. So it's like I haven't had a vaccine at all. So I need to run up to CVS yes. and get the yeah, booster. They, <laughs> <laughs> yes, they're, they're recommending the boosters now as well, which is kind right. of just like getting a flu shot every year as well. Um, right. But, uh, like, I'm vaccinated. And they're like, well, how many months ago? And I said seven. And they said, oh, that wound off. I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so because, you know, even though this was one of the most researched vaccines, it's still, it's still, you know, they're still like, oh, it must only last this long. And that's what I was just told. So, yeah, my thoughts on the pandemic is they're gonna, it's going to keep mutating. And maybe it's not. I think that maybe we're getting it under control by certain people following the guidelines, but the people that aren't vaccinated, I would say, please get vaccinated. It's not, the government's not trying to put anything in your head or anything like that. As most homeless people think, they're not trying to control you. This is just like a flu vaccine or the pneumonia vaccine. And it's just going to keep us all safe, all healthy. And please wear your mask and social distance so we can all stay safe and alive. Well, thank you so much for being this interview. It's been great. You definitely inspire me as well. Thank you. Thank you.